Welcome back. So I've been talking about matrix systems of differential equations, things like x dot equals a matrix A times x, um, where x is, is a state vector uh, and A is a matrix. And I've been talking a lot about eigenvalues and eigenvectors of this A matrix. We've been looking at, for different A matrices, what are the eigenvalues, what are the eigenvectors, and what are the implications for um, using that to solve the system. So. I say in words a lot that this matrix A has stable eigenvalues or unstable eigenvalues. And so I want to kind of clarify and slow down a little bit in this lecture and just very clearly tell you what I mean by, you know, what does it mean? What does it mean, really, to have, you know, stable or unstable eigenvalues? Okay, because this is a big deal, and I'm gonna, I like, I use this this phrasing all the time, and I realized maybe you don't know what I mean when I say the A matrix has stable eigenvalues. So I want to just dive in and make it very, very clear. Um, we know, for example, when we talk about stability, uh, if I talk about you know a really simple differential equation like x double dot plus three uh, x dot plus 2x equals 0. We know that the solutions of this differential equation are things like, uh, you know, x of t equals, there's two fundamental solutions you can find from the characteristic polynomial. And those two characteristic uh, solutions are e to the minus t and e to the minus 2t. And so any linear combination of these two solutions is also a solution to this differential equation. And we would say that this system is stable, is stable because all of the fundamental solutions are stable exponential. It's stable because uh, all fundamental solutions, kind of in this case there's only two fundamental solutions, but all the fundamental solutions e to the minus t and e to the minus 2t are in fact stable. And literally what that means is, is if I plot these functions as functions of time, they are decaying exponentials. They decay to zero as time goes to infinity. So this is stable because the solution goes to zero, it remains bounded, and in fact converges to zero asymptotically as t goes to infinity, as time goes to infinity. So that's what it means for this to be stable, is that all of these powers of e to the minus t and e to the minus 2t are stable. They have negative, they're negative real numbers, so e to a negative real number t is gonna get you know, arbitrarily small as t goes to to infinity. So how does that translate over to these matrix systems of differential equations? Well, we know in this matrix system, we're going to be talking about things like eigenvalues and eigenvectors. So we have A times T equals T times D, where these are my eigenvalues and these are my eigenvectors. And specifically, what this eigen decomposition allows me to do is it allows me to write the solution of this differential equation in terms of these t's and d's in the following way. So we can write that uh, x uh, of t, the solution of my system at time t, is equal to um, t times e to this diagonal matrix d time times t inverse times x naught. And all of the action here, the only term that depends on time here is this e to the diagonal matrix dt. Everything else is just a linear combination of the terms in this diagonal matrix. So I'm going to zoom in on this for a minute. We're going to zoom in on this e to the diagonal t. So e to the diagonal matrix t is a matrix, a diagonal matrix of e to all of my, my eigenvalues uh, in, of my matrix. So this is like e to my first eigenvalue t, e to my second eigenvalue t, dot, 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 e to my nth eigenvalue t, assuming that I have an n by n square a matrix, and everything else is zero. And so here's what I mean for an eigenvalue to be stable. For this matrix system of equations, x dot equals ax, to be stable, uh, 
What it means is that every single term in this diagonal matrix, e to the dt, every single term here has to be stable. All of these have to be bounded, remain bounded, and decay to zero as t goes to infinity for this to be a stable system. Because I'm going to be taking these combinations, this t matrix and this t inverse, these are invertible matrices, so I'm taking a combination of all of these e to the lambda t's and folding them up to build x of t. And so if even a single one of these is unstable, then my system is unstable. So let me write that out. So uh, x dot equals a x is stable if all eigenvalues lambda are stable. And I'm going to say, I'll tell you what that means in a minute. It means they all have negative real part, okay? And it's unstable if even one, or at least one, if even a single eigenvalue is unstable. Okay, uh, and now th does that make sense? Because if even one of these terms blows up to infinity and all of the other ones are stable, let's say you know all of them are stable except for this one and this one blows up to infinity because it's unstable, when I take this linear combination of all of these terms and I fold this up, x of t is still gonna blow up to infinity because this term is gonna dominate everything else and it's gonna blow up to infinity. So even one bad apple, one unstable eigenvalue is gonna blow up my whole solution and my system's unstable. So all of the eigenvalues values have to, all of these behaviors have to be stable for my global system to be stable. Okay, so now I'm going to show you what it means for an eigenvalue to be stable. Um, here, this was pretty simple because these are real valued lambdas. If we did our characteristic equation, lambda squared plus three lambda plus two equals zero, we find that lambda equals minus one and minus two. So these are both real valued lambdas and they're stable because they're negative. Okay, e to the negative power t is stable, e to the positive power t is unstable. But here, when we're talking about a generic matrix system, these eigenvalues can actually come in complex conjugate pairs, so it's a little more subtle than that. Okay, so my lambda, my lambdas could come in complex conjugate pairs a plus IB, and of course if I had an A plus IB for a real valued matrix, I would also have to have another eigenvalue A minus IB. But let's just look at this one for now, okay? And so if I take E to the lambda T, that equals E to the A plus, let's say AT plus IB T, because I can multiply both of these by T. And because of the property of exponentials, e to the at plus ibt equals e to the at times e to the ibt. This is, this is really, really useful. And now finally, I'm gonna use Euler's formula to expand this out, and we're gonna see that this equals e to the, the real part, at, times uh, something like cosine bt plus i sine bt. And what I want to point out here is that this number has kind of unit length. That's a complex number, you know, it's got a real and an imaginary part, but this has a unit length. The real part squared plus the imaginary part squared is cosine squared plus sine squared equals one. This has unit length in the complex plane. This is like unit length or size or norm, sometimes we call it norm, unit norm uh, in the complex plane. And the only thing that can make this solution blow up or decay is this e to the at. So this scales the solution. This scales the solution, this kind of oscillating solution. If I have a, a plus ib, then I get some oscillation at frequency b. And this real part here, this real part of lambda, so the real part of lambda, is what determines stability determines stability. Because if this alpha, if this A here is positive, then this uh, oscillating part is multiplied by E to the positive AT. That's gonna blow up to infinity, that's gonna be unstable. So if A is positive, my system is unstable. If A is negative, this is E to the minus number T, it will be stable and decay to zero.
So in this case here that I've drawn, if I have uh, like a less than zero, this alpha, sorry, it's not alpha, it's a. Uh, if a is less than zero, let me be really careful here not to confuse you with bad symbol writing. If the real part of my eigenvalue is less than zero, and I have some, you know, maybe I have some uh, plus IB, so I have some oscillation, I'm going to get an oscillation multiplied by this decaying exponential envelope. So I'm going to have my solution look stable as time goes to infinity. Okay, that's what I mean by a less than zero gives me a stable system. And similarly, uh, maybe I'll move this over a little bit. So this is the um, a less than zero. If I look at the a greater than zero case, if I have the uh, a greater than zero case, so the real part of my eigenvalue is greater than zero, now I'm multiplying this by a growing exponential envelope. So now my, my envelope is growing exponentially in time. And so now my oscillation is going to be growing in amplitude, and this would be an unstable system. So a less than zero is stable. A greater than zero, if my real part of my eigenvalue is greater than zero, then it's unstable. And if A equals zero, so I only have this oscillating part, we call that neutrally stable. It's, it is bounded, and it's not blowing up to infinity, but it's also not decaying to zero. It's just kind of sines and cosines, and it's going to oscillate at the same amplitude forever if A equals zero. So this is super duper important. So, um, and what I mean by stable here is, uh, stable, a stable lambda has negative real part. The imaginary part has nothing to do with the stability of that eigenvalue, it just causes us it to oscillate at a frequency b, but the real part of all of these lambdas have to be negative for this system to be stable. An eigenvalue lambda is stable if it has a negative real part, and it's unstable, an unstable lambda has positive real part in the complex plane. And so any lambda, if I have a single eigenvalue of my system, if even one of my eigenvalues of A has a positive real part, the whole system is unstable. That's how it works. Okay, so I hope this kind of clears it up for you. I'm going to use this terminology, like you're going to hear it so many times. Don't make a drinking game out of me talking about stable eigenvalues. Uh, and I wanted you to know what I meant by that. And so literally, if I, if I plot my eigenvalues in the complex plane, so here's the complex plane, and let's say I've got a bunch of eigenvalues and I've got, you know, negative one, negative two, nice and stable, nice and stable. I've got, you know, negative 1.7 plus i, negative 1.7 minus i. I've got a bunch of stable eigenvalues. Any eigenvalue in this left half plane is stable. This is called the stable left half plane because if eigenvalues live in this plane where the real part, uh, these axes, sorry, I should draw the axes, this is the real part of lambda and this is the imaginary part of lambda, which I've called, you know, B here and I've called A here. If my real part is negative, all of these eigenvalues are stable. And if my real part is positive, if I have an eigenvalue out here or here, these are unstable eigenvalues, okay? So I have the stable left half plane and the unstable right half plane. And this is gonna come up a bunch in control theory. We call these poles of a system um, in control theory. Um, you know, but they're really just the lambdas, the roots of my, my a, the, the, sorry, the eigenvalues of my A matrix or the roots of my characteristic polynomial. Um, and this is how we define stability. And similarly, any points here are neutrally stable. If they're perfectly on the imaginary axis, they're neutrally stable. Okay, I really wanted you to see that because I, I need you to have this kind of deep intuition and gut feeling of what it means for an eigenvalue to be stable. An eigenvalue of this A matrix is stable if its real part is negative, and it's unstable if its real part is positive. And for a system, I need all of the eigenvalues to be stable for this system to be stable. All right, thank you.